Hey, Jim. It's your birthday. The Indian would be the first close-up. And uh, the opening is an homage to American Prayer, which I think was his last album and is an extraordinary work of his poetry and his innermost uh, thoughts and feelings. And it summed up the whole concept of Jim. He's on his own. No music, no doors. Uh, he's isolated. He did this just before the end, before he went to Paris. Did it quickly, from what I gather. And uh, we used John Densmore as the uh, drummer, uh, the, his drummer as the uh, engineer inside the uh, booth. Is everybody in? Everybody in? Everybody. He's gone too. Ceremony. Beard and heaviness, Ernest Hemingway image. Wanted to be a filmmaker and a writer and move to Paris, get away from his troubles in America. And the loss of God. <laughs> Took a helicopter out in the desert and went right over the cliff. Shooting uh, our second picture in scope, Bob Richardson and I. Uh, this is an ILM shot. We, put, we struggled to put the clouds in, put the storm in. It was our first exposure to uh, this kind of computer work. And uh, we went back and forth. There was a lot of trial and error with ILM, but we, they ultimately did a very good job, although it was an expensive job. That's incredible it was landscape. Uh, That's my son playing young Jim. Uh, and Jim, in his uh, biographical uh, details of his life, often referred to having been heavily influenced when he was a child in the uh, desert driving with his parents. One of, his father was an admiral in the Navy, ultimately, at the Gulf of Tonkin. And uh, he was heavily influenced by uh, a car accident. He'd seen where a group of Indians had been killed, and he often said that the souls of these Indians had jumped into his uh, into his mind, into his heart. They put the peyote drums in here to echo, to forewarn the uh, Indian influence in his life. These drums we actually accumulated in uh, in uh, in uh, South Dakota at the Sioux Reservation at several uh, ceremonies. My son hated doing it, but uh, he was a brave trooper and. Uh, we decided to get rid of him and jump the movie ahead here and deal with Jim when he's an older person. Moving in out of the desert, coming to the city. That's a real sky, believe it or not, where uh, we, we had beautiful uh, deserts in the Southern California and the lizard comes in and out of the movie as a totem. Paul Rothschild was a major contributor to this film and worked with Jim Worked with Electra and uh, just loved Jim and uh, conveyed that enthusiasm to us through the whole movie, the whole process. Tried to restage Venice, California, actually at Venice, in Venice. And uh, he had no problem finding extras and people that brought out all kinds of knickknacks and uh, clothing. They wore their own things. Uh, people wanted to get into the spirit of the doors. Don't waste any time, bring Meg Ryan into the movie. She plays Pamela Morris. In the background is a lady in a leopard skin coat that is going to end up being on one of the albums that Jim made. Poets, Jack Kerouac on the road. 1950s uh, beat culture influenced Jim. And the idea is we changed the moods with the music as we moved. The early days in Venice. The sweetness. This is a beautiful shot. I love the uh, tree. This is in the canals of Venice, where it's very difficult to uh, actually shoot. And it's very hard to get equipment in here. And we had to wangle a permission from the authorities. Did a lock-off shot and a dissolve right tonight. Came back a same, same, uh, few hours later and did the same shot in the same position. Bill Graham was a major, the major, one of the major rock promoters of the of the era, and was involved with the project from the beginning. It was very helpful to us. 
is our homage to Ross Hunter. Pamela Morrison seemed to exert an influence on Jim's life that was very, very uh, uh, push-pull. They had many. Uh, he was attracted to her from it seemed from the beginning. She had a quality of small-town American uh, innocence and great beauty, but not overpowering beauty. Just attractive to him, and uh, he always seemed to need that kind of nurturing that she provided him as a more of an image I always felt more of an image than the real thing uh, they stayed together through a much turbulence up and down I think people think this film was Jim's actual film but it really was a created recreated by us based on notes that we had we never could get the original film to look at but we'd heard that it was a mixture of uh, sex and Nazism and uh, abstract images a bit loud something out of Bunuel or Dali and we tried to recreate that and throw in a little Nietzsche these are like in film school kids would uh, other kids would criticize our films, we'd have to show them and go through the torture of self-autocriticism. Ray Manzarek was in the school and uh, uh, was in film school, UCLA film school, and was in, uh, apparently met Jim there, and w w they became friends. <laughs> and this was the first shot of the film. We surprised Val by making him walk on a ledge, and we didn't tell him anything, and we told him to jump. Guess who? I quit. Jim never finished film school. He was uh, sensitive to uh, to uh, criticism, among other things, and uh, left felt that he learned everything he had to learn. That's a shot, of course, that we did with ILM. It's a, a superimposition of a moon over a landscape that we enhanced. Jim hung out in Venice, he wrote notebooks, he had friends, uh, they, uh, film school crowd, but also ran with other people, and he lived on a roof for a while. The man playing the teacher was, uh, I played him myself, uh, because I wanted to uh, give a sense of, have fun with it, and have, and have a sense also of Marty Scorsese, who was my teacher. He had a little beard at NYU, and he used to uh, run the classes. He was never that critical as I was in that movie, but I think I was having sort of a go at some of the uh, film critics that are always tearing films apart. And Phil, Jim was found pretentious by a lot of people. There was, I, see that, I saw that in a lot of his early... Uh, the film was considered pretentious, and the quotes from Nietzsche it reminded me a bit of uh, some of the films I did myself in film school. That's a great shot, and we got that actually live. We put the moon in, but we got the shot at night. These are some great shots of Venice at night. The moon we put in here. And this is some of his reading material, Artaud and McLoon and Mailer and uh, uh, Henry Miller. And he wrote many poems. Another mood now coming across us with a, with his new music. A little known song of Jim's. Showing a side that very few people will know about, that very tender man, very sensitive, very sexual. He was very connected to mythology, studied shamanism, and uh, knew of all the shamans of ancient times, all through different cultures, and uh, obviously quoted the shamanism in his own work. And the early reference to Nietzsche is interesting because he was aware of German philosophy, and Nietzsche often talks of the energy, the, the tremendous energies that are coursing through the world, the monster of energy, uh, which is one of the early quotes that we use in the film. And I have to, you have to look at this film in a sense as this wrestling with the energy that's inside Jim, this wrestling with a cosmic force that's negative and positive. It includes the devil you, and Jim. Uh, was to would never build walls around himself that would keep of decency that would keep the negative out. 
he, he embraced both. That's the hippie argument that she represents in a sense. Beauty, truth, John Keats. Whereas Jim is in a darker, more sadomasochistic trip. I could say that Jim is closer to the Rolling Stones and she's closer to the Beatles in that 1965 vernacular. All the poems have wolves in it. All the poems That's a, a line I found in a fragment of notebook. I love those lines. Found them as a fragment. They had no, uh, they were never part of a song, but all the poems have wolves in them. He, we use that quote later in the movie when they're at the precipice of the relationship. That quote comes back. And there again is a, we start to play with, uh, you know, stop motion and animation and the emotions in the clouds and the stars. That was a great shot of the beach above, looking down at the bathers. Kyle MacLaughlin coming off a David Lynch movie, Blue Velvet, always reminded me of somebody very uh, straight and square-jawed and uh, had that aspect like uh, Ray Manzarek had of straight-ahead strength. It's actually, uh, this is a version of the, something that happened one day that Manzarek referred to as a very magic day when he heard his, one of Jim's songs on the beach. And it just uh, made this possible, the concept of a, of a band that would come in, in that new age, of golden age of the birth of new ideas. If the Beatles could do it, why couldn't we do it? Val had a lovely voice, and uh, I think you heard that there, a sense of a natural a natural rhythm, a range. Uh, so did Jim. Jim had a beautiful voice. We're playing with wigs here. It's tough. You know, people are judging uh, Val by very severe standards. Of Jim was a beautiful, godlike uh, person in his youth. Val is obviously 10 years older at this point in the movie when he's making this movie. But uh, you have to go with the spirit of the person. You, you can't, you know, go with, sometimes with the exact same look. You pay for that another way. So... Yes, Val is 10 years older, but what a spirit. When the doors of perception are cleansed, things will appear as they truly have mescaline experiments, reducing the sugar flow to the... Key line from Huxley, that the acid line. Your mind will be cleansed and the doors will open. So we go right into their garage band period when they were working out. For, they were, it was a long period, almost up to a year or maybe more, when they played in their... Robbie Krieger's father's house in the garage, and they had other hangouts, trying to get their energy together as a band, get some songs together. They had to do originals. They couldn't live off these other people's songs. They had to make their own up. Here we try to show the genesis of a song and how it got fixed and how it became uh, successful, as opposed to what you just heard, which was kind of almost there, but not quite. Other members of the band there, Frank Whaley, he worked with me on Born on the Fourth of July, and uh, he, he's playing Robbie Krieger, the guitarist, and uh, Kevin Dillon, who also worked with me on Platoon, is playing uh, John Densmore, the drummer. Robbie actually wrote his, uh, the uh, song Light My Fire, and he shows that here he, he, he reveals it. But uh, Jim wrote most of the songs in general. This song uh, swept the world. Obviously in a movie, you know, people, they work for hours and uh, it doesn't come together that easily, but there is always a moment when it does do, it does come together and uh, it's nice to feel that. I mean, it is, the movie is already two hours plus and, you know, you have to, it's a question of your balance, where you want to go with the early days and working, struggling, more of that, or do you want to deal with the later days? And, choices had to be made, so it does happen quick, I suppose, by the standards of uh, music, it becomes successful, but a year a year in Venice uh, seemed a lot for, to, uh, to, to dwell on. The seeds of the movie, you have a, uh, for me, are more to do with where Jim goes once, once he becomes, once they become successful, because there were so many bands that became successful in this period. It was a period of growth. New people were being given shots, and there was must have been a hundred bands that, that did well. But there's no question that Light My Fire, that uh, the first album of The Doors, is one of the most enormously successful albums of all time, and swept the world quickly like a fire. And I heard it in Vietnam, and 
It came out, I believe, in April of 67, and I heard it pretty much right that month or thereafter in a hooch down in, uh, down in, the, in, in one, a base camp in Vietnam, and it blew us away. I mean, we were smoking dope, and, and uh, it was an acid culture. It was a, it was a culture of, of rebellion and, and sensuality and a breakthrough in sex. In sex uh, it was beyond what Playboy magazine meant. And uh, not everybody got it in the Vietnam uh, infantry. I could say that we were split. I mean, a lot of guys were listening to country music and carrying on. And, and uh, a lot of uh, black guys were listening to the Chambers Brothers, and uh, that was cool, and Jimi Hendrix. And a lot of people just got into the doors, and uh, it was more like in the Rolling Stone culture, sort of a, a word thing, too. The words were tricky and had meaning to people. This period here is the Sunset Strip period when they were working the clubs. They obviously worked far longer than in this movie, but they were immediately hot in the L.A. scene because the girls liked his ass and they liked his body and his body, you know, and his long hair and his sensual sensuality. So he was uh, sort of known around the club right away, the clubs, and had a lot of groupies. Break on through as they were singing and light my fire all of which ended up on that first album. This is, a, this is based on a club called London Fog. If you look closely, you just saw Paul Rothschild in there in the red shirt with uh, red glasses. He was the music uh, producer for Jim for most of those albums. This, is a, this would be about 66 period, the 1966 period. So uh, Herman Hermits, uh, The Monkees, uh, yeah, there a lot of groups were based on the, st on the, on the uh, Beatles, so they cut their hair like that. Doors were, were wild and more American and, you know, more that Norman Mailer kind of uh, American uh, underside, the dark side of the American dream. There was offered deals. Uh, they were, you know, no compromise, not sell out. That was the idea to these sleazy record guys. That's Paul. Paul Rothschild, <laughs> he's a character and uh, is a great, great believer, great lover of Jim. Get lost. Jim did have a problem, they said, facing the crowd and opening his eyes. He liked to sort of sing inside his own world with his back to the crowd or his eyes closed. They say this was a song about crystal meth. There's the whiskey a go-go. Now we took this whole block over on sunset and made a night scene out of it. This is a big scene, we had to close down the whole Sunset Strip, get permissions, put those cars out there, dress all those extras. It was a massive undertaking and cost cost a little, quite a bit of money. We did it between the hours, I think, of uh, midnight to, to five or six in the morning. And it was fun walking out there and controlling the Sunset Strip and having that whole strip closed down. And of course, it's tiring to work those hours, but it was fun in a, in a, in a way, an unforgettable experience. You know, looking look look in the background, you'll see depth, and you'll see the signs are redone. This is a very subjective kind of. Uh, lead into an acid trip. I swirled the sky behind him. Slowed down his voice. We added the sky and spun it through ILM, uh, George Lucas's company. And I love the effect of going to the desert from here. The idea being that he needs to expand his mind. He's just, he still, he feels like he's a, he's just not, he hasn't broken through yet. So we wanted to go back into you know, the acid uh, kind of experience that uh, many of us had in the 60s and early 70s, Timothy Leary and the music, the end. This snake story, uh, we came up with, uh, we didn't read it in Jim's uh, bios, but the idea was that the snake would take us uh, to some kind of uh, inner knowledge. A little homage to uh, Igmar Bergman. And uh, we shot this in three days in the desert, took the actors out, rehearsed it before it was hot. 
uh, we went back to ILM and I asked them to uh, blur out the uh, surroundings and play with the distortion right on Jim's face. It's an interesting effect, and I never used it again, but I tried to pulse it to the uh, drum, the peyote drum, keep it to a rhythm. We did numerous tests on this uh, um, before we came up with this, and we ultimately went with a very kind of degenerated look. We put uh, dark irises on, uh, dark uh, contact lenses on uh, on Val to enlarge the look of his eyes to make him look like he was uh, on acid. In fact, Val does look like a snake at times. He talks about kissing the snake on the lips, which is dealing with your fear, dealing with the thing that you fear the most, which is a per often on acid people would talk about the concept of, you know, fear and, and uh, people would have very what they call bummers bad trips they would go on very negative trips and jim was into that he loved to have bummers i'd get through it this never actually happened with the four of them in the desert at the same time because they all bonded in different ways but i took license to show that the group uh, had some kind of psychic uh, bond that transcended the music and we came up with the idea of this song, where, uh, which is one of the, uh, from the uh, th third album. In the song, we decided to metaphorize uh, the image of death. But Jim, who is haunted with the concept of death from his childhood when he saw the Indians dead on the side of the road, was constantly rediscovering death in, in all aspects of his life, in his own in, in the lyrics and in his in his mind, uh, a man who, as many poets are, was half in love with death. Reminds me very much of the French symbolist poet uh, Arthur Rimbaud, who often wrote of his uh, fascination and images of death in his in his poems. And many young poets who died young, whether it's Keats or Shelley or Byron, you will see this references to the Grim Reaper. That was him on the white horse. Jim has to leave the group to follow his path to his own death. That is what provide. That's what gives him his creativity. Here we we played with the sun. We put an eclipse on it, and we did some time lapse work here on the rocks, which we hadn't seen that much of in 1989, when this film was made, 1991. We went into some very str uh, strange rocks up in the, uh, I believe it was Death Valley area. I had won the Academy Award a few days before for Born on Fourth of July, in fact, about a day or two before, and I, right after the award, I flew out to the desert and uh, started shooting this scene. And I wanted a lion, a mountain lion, to come in, and that mountain lion cost us a lot of time in the cave because we were shooting in these national historic caves with with, uh, with, you know, restrictions on the shooting. We had to paint some walls, which uh, we used some water paint, but it stuck on the walls, and we got into you know, those pictures that you see. We got into a tremendous amount of negative publicity about our ruining the canyon walls in the desert, which was not true, because actually the, uh, they d eventually came off within a few days later, but uh, by that time the, the publicity was out that we had desecrated a national monument. In the cave, he sees an Indian spirit, and he sees his own death, huh? or feels it. The shot's interesting, it took a lot of work, but we went right into the eyeball and tried to uh, to go into the next scene and see the Indian singing, see, the, see Jim, seeing him back himself, singing the end. That shot was very difficult to get. But it sort of seeds the next creativity, uh, which was one of the most powerful songs on the first album and put him in another zone, uh, the end. When he started to sing about the Oedipus uh, theory in rock music, nobody had done that before. Nobody had sung about so personal a relationship to mother and his mother and his father as, as Jim Morrison had. 
And uh, I gathered from people that had been there that when he first sang these this song at the Whiskey A Go Go in Los Angeles, it just shocked uh, shocked uh, the culture, and they were thrown out of the club by the owner. That was death up there on the on the second floor, listening to Jem waiting. We decided to introduce him as Thimata, as Bergman had in Seven Seal. They had so we had so many groupies on this movie that were so loved to show up and just be there, and they were so patient, they were so into Jim. This took three nights uh, of shooting, three days actually, and uh, once we hit this level. We were in a new mood on the movie. We were shooting as much, as, obviously, in chronology as we could, because I like to shoot that way. But it was important for Val to keep building his character to new and new depths, and he had to take chances. In order to take chances, he had to grow as a singer, and in order to grow as a singer, he had to start at the beginning and work his way. It would have been very mistaken for us to shoot to a, an end scene and try to shoot him singing a, a more complicated, a, a different type of song and later in his career. It's sort of like uh, song, singing songs like this. It's like exercise in a way, or sports. You have to expand that muscle. However, I found that as we went, you know, Jim uh, Val was getting, you know, would get more and more tired. His vocal cords were not as strong as professional singers are. So we had to be very careful in how much we could use him. I believe in this night, he probably did too many takes. 15 takes sometimes on different angles and his vo vocal cords got hoarse and we paid the price in, in delays so we ended up having to really be very conservative with uh, Val. We have Jim in the background at times. Uh, Paul Rothschild did a technically brilliant thing with Bud Carr and, and his technicians Bruce Botnick in blending the, uh, the real Jim with Val Kilmer. And we were able to go back and forth, uh, click tracks and all, to actually record the best of Val Kilmer live. We had a pre-recorded Val Kilmer, we had a, obviously a pre-recorded Jim, and we had a live Val Kilmer. And we were able to flit in and out of uh, the live live Val Kilmer and the pre-recorded Val Kilmer. And we also did some post dubs that were improving on Val's performance. So. Uh, this is the first time I'm told by Paul Rothschild that this has ever been done on film. It required enormous amount of, of technical machinery. We had a van outside with, with state-of-the-art equipment in 1990. Now we have obviously the, the lenses, the, the dark lenses, are con I, the dark contact lenses are back in Val's eyes, distorting his look. He had never said fuck until then on a stage. It really pissed off uh, the owner. There you saw him. People were shocked when they first heard this. And uh, he seemed to enter into a psychodrama with his parents. Then the Dionysian dance. Uh, I had choreographers work with Val, try to uh, get the, get a sense of this movement that Jim Morrison always had a great great dance. Uh, we used a double there for the, some of the inserts on the, on the f legs, because Val is much bigger than Jim, uh, you know, physically, but, uh, and was tired too, it's hard to do this on a <laughs> continuing basis. But the sense of die, ecstasy and dizzying kind of. It was nothing like this was ever so sexual, the music had this is the owner of Electra Records, and uh, he signed Jim, I, th I think, as a result of uh, this, these appearances at the uh, Whiskey. They were fired from the club by the owner, who didn't understand the music. Uh, Val was, uh, I, I can't say that Val was especially a fan of Jim Morrison. He had read the book and felt an identity, identification, but uh, he, the music, I gather, was new to him, and uh, he learned it. And when he came uh, to see me, we talked about this originally a few years before, uh, he came to see me a second time. Uh, he'd actually, Val had, run, had tried out for the platoon uh, for this Elias role that was played by Willem Dafoe, and given a very eccentric performance as, uh, as Elias. Uh, 
seemed to me as a very strange man, but I found him haunt fascinating, and I thought of him when I read The Doors, and I was very, very much impressed by his work in uh, Willow. Uh, I, saw him, I found him dashing, and uh, he reminded me of Morrison. So when we came back to the film in 1990, he was uh, ready to work and came fully prepared, did his own audition, filmed himself, very narcissistic in that sense. And I thought that was right. He caught the flavor of narcissism that Morrison had, the sense of self, the sense of presence. But Tavel was uh, not Jim in the sense that uh, Jim was more of the 60s generation, Val was more of the uh, 80s generation and looking back at Jim it was a strange for me as a member of the 60s generation I suppose it was interesting to see the differences Meg too Meg was uh, sometimes shocked by the behavior that was described by as Pamela Morrison's behavior and had difficulty entering into that uh, mental space that was required to uh, you know take off the gloves, not to have moral judgments, not to have revisionism from the 1980s, 90s, uh, you know, concepts of gender and role. We shot the home, uh, Super 8, we were shooting Super 8 footage here in San Francisco. We re This is very interesting because it's sort of a forerunner of uh, what we did in Natural Born Killers and a bit of the JFK, too. I mean, we have a huge crowd, a lot of money is being spent to redo this, and we're, and we're shooting the whole thing in Super 8. So, usually, you know, you shoot this in 35 millimeter. This was pretty gutsy. That's my wife at the time, Elizabeth. And uh, we had fun in the park, and everyone turned out, all the hippies from, the old hippies from San Francisco, and, a lot, and the younger people from the 80s were, acted like hippies. There's death. And again. Come on, baby, light my fire. I went back to the song again because it was really their anthem song. It was their most commercial song. It played the singles. It put them on the map and made that first album the uh, the hit that it was. This is the, a homage to the Fillmore up in uh, San Francisco where we shot it. That wasn't the original Fillmore, but it's a... Uh, and uh, Jim was famous for all kinds of freedoms on the stage, jumping out there and... He loved the, uh, the bond, the, the being eaten alive, the concept of being devoured by his audience. We continued the home movie aspect into the, uh, right all the way up into New York to show the sort of giddying sense of, you know, ad that first adulation, that first love that you get from an audience and never be repeated. That's their new manager, uh, Bill Siddons. This is, this is based on a, interview they did, home movie type interview, which I saw. They're on their way here. They're national heroes and New York looms, 1967. This is a certainly a cutting edge moment in, in our history, 67, 68. Um, New York was in, in the grip of big change, Andy Warhol, and uh, there was a new fashion consciousness that had come from England. People's clothes, their hair, their behavior was changing. We shot this actually in New York and uh, got quite a big mob out there on 7th Avenue. And there's the Whiskey Bar song from Bertolt Brecht's uh, Whiskey Bar, uh, written by XYZ, but uh, that was uh, an anthem song for Jim, We Must Die. I was bold in those days, and I was, uh, you know, ready to take on actual personage, personages, uh, I had said, well, let's go for it. I mean, everyone warned me not to do things like Ed Sullivan or Andy Warhol, but I said, let's do it. Let's try for it. Let's not get self-conscious. Let's stay loose. And actually, this guy who was almost impossible to work with because he was an old-fashioned vaudeville comedian looked like Ed Sullivan in a weird kind of way, but he would uh, never repeat his lines. He would insist that he was right all the time. Very interesting to work with. Something like that. But you see here, Meg Ryan playing Pamela is already very possessive in a way of, of Jim, always possessive. People said that she was a strange contradiction, that she would be a monster. Many people didn't like her that I talked to, that knew Jim. They, they didn't understand why he stayed with her. 
They were uh, censored on the air with uh, Ed Sullivan and warned about this. This is Josh Evans, the son of Bob Evans and Ellen McGraw. He worked with me on uh, Born on the Fourth of July, and uh, he played the brother of Tom Cruise, and I used him again with Bill, for Bill Sins. I felt that from 1967 on, there was a bit of a, a stronger and stronger split between Morrison and the rest of the Doors, that he, Jim, continued sort of on another path of self-exploration, and there started to be a differentiation in, in their approach. And, Now, apparently, uh, Jim did say it on TV, and uh, whether the reaction was as acute, I don't know, but I know I was told that the Sullivan people told me he would never be invited back. Obviously, Jim made many trips to New York, but this being a movie, I tried to put in, uh, you know, the concept that uh, things changed uh, pretty radically in New York. They were playing in a place called Undines in New York under the bridge on 57th Street in that area, and, and were very popular. A famous set of pictures was taken by a woman called Gloria Stavers that put him on the, in the Vogue crowd, in the Vogue magazine kind of fashion crowd, and began, I feel, to change, uh, made him very aware of the cult of celebrity, and started to sophisticate him, move him out of that California uh, beach boy mentality that... Uh, California as new age, new, 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 ex, this is more the old age. This is a return to Fellini, uh, Italian movies, French movies, which also was a part of Jim. The androgynous image. And a dizzying sense of uh, self and loss of, uh, you know, obviously the question arises of who am I? And, what does this all mean? Yeah. Mirror upon mirror, people telling you you're great. The, God of rock. the music changes, the second album, Strange Days. It becomes weirder, kinkier, a little more decadent New York. Alexander the Great was someone referred to by Jim and obviously has historical significance because he was handsome and he was on top. And he was a god and a warrior too. So I think this is the first time I jumped out of the doors to go into a Lou Reed uh, song, Velvet Underground, there's death. The Velvet Underground of, uh, you know, Andy Warhol group, Lou Reed. Warhol gave uh, many parties at something called The Factory. Drugs were very popular, heroin, acid. Paul Williams was an yeah, interesting music composer of the uh, 60s and 70s. This is an early view at Michael Madsen, who uh, uh, plays Tom Baker. That's, I believe, a Rauschenberg in the background. We used dizzying camera movements. We tried to get a sense of nothing staying the same. We'd play with a second, the lighting on the walls of that period. That's a real uh, snakeskin uh, jacket on Jim. Costs a lot of money and it really picks up the light. I love this line coming up. Look, that's Jim Morrison. I like the door. Hey, John. I like the door. Get out of here, man. Wacky. Wacky. Hey, come with me. Andy's waiting in the bedroom for you. <laughs> no, no, not now. Let's do this. There's the Indian. It's my impression of a party in New York. You want to come? This woman is based on a, one of the Velvet Underground artists called Nico. She died uh, in the 1980s of a heroin overdose. Very beautiful, apparently. Very beautiful Swedish or German woman and could, uh, had a great affair with Jim. They drank and, and smoked and took drugs and fucked uh, to each other down into the ground. Norman Mailer's at the party, Warhol, everything's coming at you, you never know. 
the guys want to get out of there. It's a little freaky for them. And this is like an interesting moment. Jim wants... He did it out of sync. You can't lip movement. Make the miss. Camera never stops. Lights in their face. It's a great song. I love that rushing that, in, that Russian that comes in the middle of the song. And it's like he's bored with the group. He doesn't want to. The bond is broken for him. Anything goes. Nietzsche rules. Death Waits. Lou Reed was uh, ahead of his time. Here is uh, Death again <laughs> in uh, drag, Death and Drag. And we did a double, a double on Morrison here. This is... Uh, <laughs> we're playing around, having fun. Went into another room and asked Crispin Glover to take a shot at Andy. And I think he did a pretty interesting job. I gathered from people who knew him that Andy's dialogue, he was very bright, but he was very fatuous in his dialogue and would say the obvious, and sometimes it would just hang there, and he would be waiting to see your response. The camera work is floating, druggy, very free, considering we're shooting scope. You have to realize that we're moving it around very, very, very lucidly. I don't know really what happened between Jim and him. This is all conjecture on our part, but I just wanted to get a sense of a facade, something shimmering that is just mysterious and under, it just does, has no meaning or does it have meaning. It's, you question yourself because when you do these kind of drugs, as I remember in the 60s, 70s, I think sort of bounces back on yourself and paranoia kind of sets in. Barbara Ling, our, our designer, really played around with lights and effects of that period. And you can see the light revol revolving. Uh, she used every trick she could find from that period to give it density and de texture. This is Nico. Uh, it looks amazing. Look at the way the light coming off her dress. This shot was done late in the film in New York in the, in the snow in the winter. And it was the, one of our last shots. And I love it uh, because he just parts from Meg here. She goes right, he goes screen left. Obviously there were many beautiful girls in this movie that contributed their services and made the place uh, jumping. It just had much more, many beautiful women in this movie, probably more beautiful than they were at the time, in density anyway. Even death goes by, reminding him that even in New York, death gets there. And. Uh, we go into a mood of decadent joy. Many people remember the popper scene in the elevator because of the luscious breasts on uh, Christina Fulton. And I can't say I disagree. We got an R for this film and we had to be careful. Of, we were making a fairly large budget film for Kuroko, but they were very supportive. Of are getting uh, out there, but obviously these scenes turn people some turn some people off in the country, and we lost a lot of our audience with this kind of uh, explicit uh, imagery. But there's no way to make this movie in the Fellini type way that Morrison's life was run with avoiding this. Pam doesn't fit into New York; she never did, and. <laughs> uh, I think in some ways she brought a conventional morality to a situation that was unconventional and never could adapt to that. That's not to say Pamela was not wild. She was wild. But uh, there was an image in her mind, a fantasy of living with Jim in some kind of picture book marriage based on what her parents and, and or had, had lived. And I met her parents and they were ultimately very unhappy with this portrayal of her did not want any image of drugs to in, 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 in enter into the into image of her. This scene is in part based on the reception to his poetry book, which he did publish himself. It was a very negative uh, reception. And 
the critics always gave him a hard time. I always found that his primitiveness, uh, in a sense, hurt him with them. Uh, he was a threat, a, a challenge. He was unique. And uh, in word culture, reactive word culture, it's difficult to sometimes appreciate his the simplicity of his lyrics. You know, uh, ride the snake to the lake uh, type of lyrics is not sometimes under, you know appreciated by people who want Philip Larkin or T.S. Eliot, but there was a primitive strength to his verbiage. And this woman is based on Pauline Kael, sort of as a, pictured as a crone or as a witch, you know, hating, living on her negativity. Her face reveals all. Our uh, clothes designer, I thought, really did an interesting job in suggesting the changes in his personality, uh, in, in his character, really, through, the, through his clothes. Kathleen Quinlan uh, plays one of the reporters uh, that interviewed him. She, she's a composite of uh, different people, uh, different women in his life. There's no way to deal with the dozens of women that Jim slept with and, and had relationships with. They were all over the place in different cities. I had to uh, come to a condensation, and I chose Kathleen to represent three or four experiences that he had that were strong, startling. One of them was with a witch in New York, a supposed witch who uh, shared with him uh, Celtic, Celtic concepts of witchcraft, and which he, of course, being shamanistic, uh, appreciated. But she was also, the blood, the concept of blood was with another woman who he shared with. He cut himself and shared the blood with him, with her. The witch uh, who saw the, who uh, was pictured in this film Perhaps we made a mistake by using her name, but she obviously was very upset with me because of, we incorporated other, other, other actions with other females inside her story. So I think that she uh, she was very upset and uh, threatened to kill me or put a put a curse on me for the rest of my life. Maybe she has because sometimes you never know with these witches. But I think Kathleen was splendid in this movie and very free with her body and with her mind, and very generous, a wonderful actress, very under, underestimated and underused. It's a tough scene to shoot for an actress to maintain uh, composure. It's very European style that way, to have your breasts in a camera and just continue on the scene in, in an unselfconscious way like Kathleen does. I always find that difficult with American actresses to do that, whereas we find it much more Asian and Europeans are easier with it. You might notice in the scene where he told the story at the press conference, he lied about his parents. He said that they had died in the desert, and uh, she's going to catch him on this. Cocaine, of course, is a devastating drug. And, uh, it hurt Jim, I think. That which he did of it, he had a period, of, uh, uh, an extended period of cocaine, and uh, as other people did later in the 70s and the 80s, and still doing now. So cocaine continues to rear its ugly head continues to do is cut its swathe of destruction. We went to Carmina Burana here, drinking the blood. I love this set. Uh, Barbara Ling designed it. Bob Richardson uh, lit it. And it is uh, a loft, uh, it was supposedly in downtown New York, shot in L.A., actually. And uh, the lighting, the effects, the water dripping off the glass. Sense of Fulfilling one's fantasies on earth. A sense of being free. Uh, Jim reputedly uh, had problems uh, with potency. Uh, Paul Rothschild has told me some stories. That he did consult doctors and had, had some concerns about it. And uh, it's an interesting uh, thematic to the, to the movie that he is enabled to have to have satisfactory sex with uh, Pamela here, whereas he's able to have it under more, uh, you know, uh, dangerous conditions, sinister and dangerous conditions with, with other women. What do you want me to do? Jim started to drink to, in fact, uh, from the accounts that we, I've had, and I read, I was able to get 250 transcripts with interviews with people that he had, uh, that Jerry Hopkins had interviewed, uh, 
for his book on Morris in the first book in 1980. And those transcripts revealed a man who moved out of the realm of drugs early on into a realm of more and more alcohol. Jim was also Irish, and maybe he did not drink the quantities that are that are, he said to have drunk, but, you know, being Irish, I don't know if his genetic uh, structure was such that, you know, maybe he was not able to consume alcohol. And I've heard that theory, too, that he, a few drinks would do him in. Where's the new wine? The key line I always felt in his life came from one of his songs. Where's the new wine? Johnny on the vine. There was a, a closed-off sense with Jim that he never could move, that life was sealed, that life was foredoomed, that he, in a sense, knew he would die young. I didn't sense that sometimes he would allow himself the freedom to break out and explore beyond, that the new wine would, would be dying on the vine. This was a tough scene to do, to do with the actors. It required them to be nude and to be... and, and to be drunk, angry, fighting, reversals of emotions. Supposedly, Jim hung out on ledges on several occasions, walked the ledge, hung from the windows, tempted death. It seemed that uh, the song Wild Child uh, was a song for Pam. We changed the speed here tried to go for the more primitive view of a monk, of an ape. Well, things are in an unsatisfactory impasse in his relate Here, he's able, obviously, to have an orgasm with Pam, but again, it comes out of danger and near death and drunkenness and fighting, uh, a behavior pattern that is hard to repeat or to top because it has to get more and more addictive. So I think Jim is, in a sense, reaching with a new wine, dying on the vine, reaching an impasse, and he's about to explode. And uh, I don't think he can get Kathleen Quinlan out of his blood here. And uh, the idea of sex in strange places at the last minute, with crowds yelling and waiting, was very Nietzschean. It's an interesting fact that Jim's father was actually at the Gulf of Tonkin which is a historically important event. It was that event that was manipulated into, uh, to force the American uh, legislature to declare us the, uh, a war against uh, North Vietnam. And it was in, in a wholly staged event. There was no aggression on the part of North Vietnam. It was uh, maneuvered and manipulated by the Americans to create a state of war. And his dad, therefore, was heavily involved and implicated in the origins of the Vietnam War, which puts Jim Morrison right at the uh, center of uh, these colliding forces. He refused to see his father after he left home and uh, apparently hated him or expressed that hatred in his lyrics. I got a chance to meet his father uh, years later when I set out to make the film and get permission from the parents with Bill Graham and Sasha Harari. Hatred's very underestimated emotion. Hatred is an underestimated emotion. Doesn't matter anymore, does it? We had an object. There seems to be no core of security or love in Jim's life. From his uh, youth, it seems that the only thing he has is his work and the crowd and his relationship to the crowd. He was the Marshall McLuhan of crowd control. He often referred to Hitler and uh, to uh, the concept of using a crowd uh, for sex, penetrating the crowd. It was at New Haven that he was... Uh, he was mazed. And that macing set up an uh, enormous sort of anger that propelled him to the first of his many, uh, several, uh, the first of his uh, public arrests and set the stage for the Miami trial. I love this uh, concert. It was one of our, the first of our big concert pieces. We really went all out on, well, the end. It would really be the first one to Whiskey A Go-Go, but this one 
is the first major crowd scene in an auditorium. And uh, I mean, after all, what Jim Morrison was was a great manipulator of crowds. And aside from being a poet, he had this other Hitlerian quality, this ability of a great performer to uh, excite a crowd, to uh, make the people go crazy. I think sometimes our concerts probably look better than bigger, better than the actual concerts looked on film. But that's also the power of film, the power of uh, Cinemascope. Backdoor Man is uh, uh, one of the early soul uh, songs that he sang, uh, one of the few songs that he, he put in his repertory. Repertoire that one of the few songs he put in his repertoire that came from, I believe, Willie uh, Dixon. These shots I always one of some of my favorites in the film. Going down on his knees from the back, from the rear, seeing the crowd, the light, the wash. The lighting here, I think, is, is uh, intriguing. And you see a sort of a malice, a, a devilish commitment. Uh, Jim took on the cops. He, any authority figures were a problem for Jim, whether it was his father or police or military in Vietnam. It was his song uh, in 1967 8 uh, about Vietnam, Unknown Soldier, that kicked off uh, the first of his public boycotts of his songs by the radio DJs and was a problem uh, commercially for him. They started to be cut off the air. I wanted the sense that the rest of the band was not happy with his uh, ad libs, improvisations, but they went with it because he was the uh, the star. The crowd came to see him, and the crowd demanded more and more and more each time. And we tried to build this through the movie where the crowd is bigger and and louder and more demanding. Ultimately, he had to feed them. And he was arrested right on stage. <laughs> From the uh, documentary footage at the time, it was apparent that Jim was in shock at this arrest and didn't expect it. But Kathleen Quinlan likes it because it gives, uh, makes for a better story. And we all know that the newspapers like a better story at any price. She is a newspaper reporter. Uh, at least uh, an underground newspaper reporter. It's meant to be ironic. These are the actual Jim's lines. And he did wear a 66 on his uh, shirt. But with the soul of a clown, it always forces me to blow it at the most crucial moment. His own words. And a necessary interregnum in the movie to uh, give you a... Uh, put us back in the perspective of the opening. The uh, movie had reaches a, a, the first act crescendo, I think, with the New Haven arrest. This second period is a period of... Uh, uh, decadence in Los Angeles. But bear in mind that with Jim, as with people like that, with tremendous decadence comes uh, tremendous creativity, and that it's what amazes me about Jim is that at a period of uh, what most people would consider decline, conventional decline, uh, he turned out one of his best albums right at the end, uh, which you're going to see coming up in, later in the film. But not only was it a great music album, but it was also a wonderful, he turned out a second album called American Prayer, which is his own confession straight to a camera of his own feelings. So, uh, sometimes drinking and drugging, well, they may lead to physical decline and errant behavior, but sometimes they lead to a freeing up of an inner spring. Well, this is a climactic scene with Meg and uh, Val going at it in terms of 
things will never be the same after this day. They're sort of both drugged out. We lost the car. <laughs> she doesn't remember that they lost the car. This continuation of decadence and excess obviously upset some people and some critics. and They feel that this film is, is depressing, but uh, it depends how you look at it. You know, is it depressing or is it humorous to some people? She always wanted to get married. That was uh, part of that conventional upbringing she had. As I say, I, I uh, met uh, their par Jim's parents and I talked to both of them about making this movie. And they w chose to remember Jim from his youth uh, when, uh, when he was a good student, when he was a loving son and there was a denial about the later Jim. There was no real understanding of it. They, they knew that he was a rock star. They knew that he had made history in a, in a strange American way, but there was no real understanding of why or how. And they, there was a feeling that it was maybe something beyond their understanding, something freaky and strange. I don't think the father that I saw was very happy with his son and what happened to him. And especially his early death was very sad to any parent. At one point in this relationship, Pam wanted to be the recordist, the archivist, archivist of, his, uh, of his notes and songs and drawings. So she assigned herself that role. Meanwhile, the turkey got burnt. We shot this scene up in Laurel Canyon in a very bright and shiny house. And Laurel Canyon was a, a nest for the 60s. And uh, the scene uh, never really happened, um, but it just occurred to us that it would be fun to sort of celebrate Thanksgiving in a non-Rockwell fashion. But being Jim, of course, he would want to introduce people to each other in, in that hippie style, even girlfriends, lovers. That's... Uh, Jody Bisset, I think she was on Melrose Place a few years later. Pamela would get uh, pissy and angry and would do outrageous things. And there was many witnesses to different kinds of outrageous behavior on her part. She would get hysterical and attack Jim. And Jim would always end up going back to her. And they'd be fighting and making up, fighting and making up. Uh, many people attest to this. And there was one incident where uh, her Thanksgiving dinner was ruined and a duck was ruined, a turkey. But I'm confused between whether it was a turkey or a duck, and I think Pamela has me confused. This is a typical Jim uh, behavior, he, hanging on ledges, asking to be killed, making dramatic situations public, acting out songs. Tom Baker, Billy Idol, these guys represent the... Uh, Jim had many groups of friends, again, tearing at him. And Tom Baker and that group was one group. That he, there was forces always pulling at him. People, he was so popular and successful that many people wanted to be with him. These songs are more or less in chronology. Not to touch the earth. I love this shot. We did it up in San Francisco at the... Uh, and uh, we did it in an outdoor stadium. We have several 2,000 people showed up sh shooting two nights in a row in a light rainstorm. Look at this shot. It's uh, one of my favorite moments. He drinks the scotch and hits the stage. We brought Sioux Indians down from uh, South Dakota, friends of ours, to dance, carry on, and they were shocked by some of the behavior of the San Francisco hippies who were came to this evening on acid, ready to party all night. We had no problem finding extras who would strip and dance naked. Hundreds volunteered. I think it was called the Water Park outside San Francisco, about 45 minutes outside. Pamela had a relationship with a European man uh, who threaded his way through her life 
And uh, I've heard, we've heard many stories about him through, uh, he seemed to have been a steady factor in our life. By all accounts, he was an Italian, he may have been a count, and he shows up here and again, and seems to have been a heroin uh, user and had influence, uh, influenced Pam to use heroin. This incident uh, was alleged to have occurred by a friend of Paul Rothschild's who lived near near them in Laurel Canyon. And uh, one night, Pam ran into his house, uh, hysterical and frantic, and claimed that Jim had tried to set the, her on fire in the closet. Jim allegedly hit a police car in one of his escapades. But driving this whole sequence, this montage, where I'm getting a lot of information across, is the central song, which is an acceleration of the concept of immortality, not to touch the earth, not to see the sun, nothing left to do but run, run, run. He gets married to the witch. He gets witch married. I mean, it's a Celtic oath. That's the real Patricia Keneally in the middle, who knew Jim and had a relationship with him. Death does not part, only lack of love. And that's the actual uh, marriage uh, vow. And I thought we, in this flight of fantasy, that. Even Ray Manzarek, finally, square as he was, would see what Jim sees. The feather is passed to Jim from the Indians, the ghosts of American culture. Jim, to me, represents a part of American culture that's trying to get back in touch with that ancient shamanistic impulse to be closer to the natural state of man where women will free themselves and men will free themselves and the fire takes over and Jim is now down around the fire he's no longer on the stage there's Leonard Crow Dog one of the medicine men of the uh, Sioux Indian tribe and there's death and here we're coming back over the crowd to reveal the flames, Barbara Ling's design, uh, licking at the back of the... The flames are everywhere. The world is on fire. It's orgiastic. And uh, I'm very pleased with the cinematics. I think that you get a sense of breaking on through again. But to where, we don't know. We're using, uh, uh, we're making use of the uh, techno crane here everywhere we can, which was a device brought over from uh, England, uh, designed in England. It's like a modern uh, mini crane that has the ability to move through crowds over crowds. And as this shot shows, we can go overheads and through crooks and corners. But what does Jim have at this point of his life? He's broken all the taboos, it seems. He's at a point of emptiness, what the Buddhists call shunyata. What was that More Girls, another album, Soft Parade. A decadent album, in my estimation. What was 
Well, you can see his voice is... Uh, Val did a nice job of creating a sense of uh, tired voice, a hoarse voice. But at the same time, the song, to me, which was considered simplistic uh, by critics of The Doors, uh, is a lovely song, and a very lyrical one. And uh, in spite of the sickness, it, it seems apparent. He is creative. All these songs are coming forth from him in this period. The film is shot according to those songs. So it's a, it's a good example of how behavior is irrelevant sometimes to, uh, to, to, to what you're doing, to the inner work, to the inner mind. People get stuck on behavior. They look at appearance. They look at the public appearance of, of and, uh, you know, your perception of you. Uh, I've had those problems in my life. Bad PR, bad public relations, uh, misunderstood behavior. And I identify with uh, Jim, as do many people. It's... To be misunderstood is, is a recurring problem for anybody, especially teenagers and, and, and adolescents who feel that. Their parents, their teachers, uh, their fellows misunderstand an inner working that is sometimes mysterious even to ourselves. I love this. Uh, we, had, we had to wrestle with the Dean Martin uh, show to get this, but uh, the Doors actually sold a commercial to... Uh, uh, sold the music to light my fire to a commercial for Ford. The sale was canceled actually by uh, before it became uh, it got out. Uh, Jim had a lot to do with the cancellation, and it was a source of tension between the group. But it was never actually made the air. I took the license and showed it on the air here because I do believe that it was an interesting uh, br uh, uh, split between uh, Jim and the rest of the Doors. Whatever um, Ray Manzarek will say about that incident, it's true that the so song was initially sold. Jose Feliciano had already done a version of Light My Fire, which had been a number one hit in America. So the song had been uh, commercialized, it's true, but not by Jim Morrison. You know what you're saying to Certainly this is one reason why uh, Manzarek uh, hated this movie and hated me. One for all. These studios were built to specifications with Paul Rothschild's input and Robbie Krieger helped us enormously. Robbie was, the, and John Densmore also, Robbie was uh, very helpful to Frank uh, Whaley learning guitar. And Densmore was in and out and helpful to uh, Dylan. But we soaked both their minds for as much information as we could about the period and about the music. This period, this section of the film, one could call pathetic. I don't know if if you're listening to Gustav Mahler, you would know that feeling of it going on and on about the pathos. I think it's legitimate criticism of the film that it does dwell into the uh, this side of Jim. Uh, for whatever reason, I personally like it because it takes me through those songs and makes me understand those songs but some people would maybe have wanted to lose the outdoor concert and maybe go right to Miami and get on with the movie it's uh, the film is two hours and 15 20 minutes and uh, is epic in its approach I love this uh, we're moving with a technocrane, which is, you know, an in interior set here. It's a small crane that can move, uh, make these moves. Uh, you could not normally do this without taking off the roof and shooting on a huge soundstage. Soft Parade is one of the great songs and comes again from a, a, an album that most people think is an inferior album. You can see a hand up there where it says Revealed. That's Michael Wincott. I used him in talk radio and here. And in uh, Born on the Fourth of July, Michael is a very talented actor and he played the crazy teenager in talk radio. One of my favorite pieces of film I've ever shot would be Miami. Just love this concert. And I love the effort, the energy that uh, the crowd brought to the scene. It was just a, an intersection of us with them. We had a cr our crew was 
We shot this in four or five days. And we decided to go for it. Let it all hang out. Here's a movie critic. Uh, one must ask, why are you here? Morrison was late to this concert, and he came drunk and ready to party. This concert marked the end of his sort of American uh, uh, cultural life. You notice death on the airplane? Jim was repeatedly doing some heroin, too. Val created the illusion of a belly. He got a little heavier, but essentially uh, was able to uh, jam his belly out there and give us the impression he was much fatter than he really was. We had to thread the difference here between keeping him uh, he had to play young scenes uh, around this area, so he also uh, was faced with coming back and forth. What you gonna do for something sacred? It seems that Jim always knew that. He always respected his audience. He gave him his best, but he also hated the carnival atmosphere of the crowd, the, the need to exhibit himself, which had grown to an addiction. So it's a really ambivalent it's a contradictory uh, attitude towards what he was doing. He loved it and he hated it. Managers would screw them over. Managers would change the deal. He was being used. Having seen uh, many uh, films in the, set in the 50s and the 40s uh, that dealt with jazz musicians or people who had uh, gone downhill, uh, I often found those films were a little bit clipped or sanitized in the sense of not really fully dealing with the descent to plunge into hell. And in this movie, I suppose I went maybe that one extra beat. I'm not sure it was right or wrong, but I wanted to give full, full plumage in a sense, the full sense of having a, a descent uh, that uh, no one else would share his journey, that he would be isolated in that uh, fall. And it would be sad and pathetic, or like Mahler's uh, symphonies, there would be that extra plunge into sort of a romantic uh, pathos. This is a uh, water uh, reflection that Barbara Ling threw up there. We put uh, all kinds of dyes into the water and played with the uh, colors, the moods of the scene, which is a precursor to what we tried to do with uh, Heaven and Earth and uh, Natural Born Killers, to control the moods through the lighting, or really to suggest the moods, suggest to suggest the moods through the lighting. Five to one, one in five, no one here gets out alive. It is a great song, and uh, underestimated song. And it was a song he actually was singing in New Haven. True story. Smoking dope on the stage and just getting away with it when the cop came up. This is Val at his best. And he came out there and he hit it. This is a techno crane swirling around his head. We got a great extra to jump off the balcony right into a crowd. The sense of suicide is on the is on this is on the hall that night. Robbie Krieger himself is under the influence of the drug that Jim gave him. There's no hope. No one's getting out of this place alive. We got a crowd that was hopped up, ready to go. Val really gave all his voice into it. He went hoarse doing this. And uh, he threw the mic out there and he hit the promoter of the Miami concert. Man came out on the stage and offered him uh, a lamb, which he took and wandered around with for a while. 
He pretended to give a blowjob to Robbie, so they said. And with the basis on which they brought the lawsuit, naked people I threw on the stage, uh, whether that happened in Miami, they happened in various concerts that Jim gave, but may not have happened in Miami itself. This woman's uh, Ruben's luck, I'd say. Billy Idol's up there, and he loved it. He was like a main motivator for the action. Off stage and on stage. Val looks remarkably like Jim with his beard and his hat. It's a great shot. And a moving crowd around the room trying to get a sense of mass. Fights were breaking out. The lyrics provoked the fights. I wanted to go back to the Indian concept that he'd lost touch with his inner being and was struggling to get it back. And the Indian is leaving him now. This is live action. I guess now, in these days, we do it with computer, but we put him up on the elevator like an apparition, sent him up the stage, and he disappeared in the light. You see the lighting techniques uh, flooding in and out. Twenty-five hundred people. Jim would take on the crowd. People would yell obscenities, and he would love it and feed it back to them. And he said these lines. He called his audience in Miami uh, Adolf Hitler type people. This stage, he really was pushing the crowd. He wanted to uh, push the buttons and uh, challenge them. Why are you watching this? It was an interactive experience early on. I mean, he, it was postmodern in the sense that he included the audience as part of the show and that saying that, you know, it was in, he was unable to, there was no proscenium anymore. He, he had joined, it was the subjective, it merged with the objective. And then they insulted Miami Beach. These are actual words from the uh, concert. And actually, women uh, responded to the call for nakedness. From what I've heard, this we took a little license. I think you're going to see about a dozen women out there on the shoulders of men with their breasts showing. But I had no control over that. The audience took over at that stage and decided to strip. These are hard scenes to direct. I mean, it does have a mass energy that takes over. And I felt that uh, impulse that Jim was talking about. The crowd is monster of energy. He never showed his penis per any con any eyewitness that I've ever heard. The only eyewitness was uh, a, a suspected person who really had no basis. I, so all the charges about him showing his uh, penis and masturbating are a suspect. That was Billy Idol you saw briefly there, and the fight developed. Once he started, it, they thought he was masturbating, and they, they jumped him and tried to close him down, and a riot developed. Now I wanted to let loose here with... The stage collapsed, which is an amazing shot. If you look closely, that was a hydraulic system that we had to bring it down, and I wanted to get Jim out into the crowd and bond him with the crowd before he got arrested. This is... I'm. An amazing shot. We just went with a steady cam into the crowd and we really got them to go follow him and follow Val and naked. Look at the lighting and you'll see the risks that we were. The death is right on his shoulder, of course, dancing with him. This is a song that Jim had, which came out in Miami. Dead Rats, Fat Cat. This is a push. Focus problems all the way through, but we went with it. As close as I could come to DeMille, Ten Commandments, Golden Calf scene, which I saw at the age of nine or ten and was just blown away by in you know, a Florida drive in. Jim on the shoulders of the crowd. Mr. Morris. We use a diopter here. The trial is surreal and occurs in. Jim's outer imagination, it's unbelievable to him what's happening. Ironically, he didn't have much support from the rock uh, community. He was uh, too controversial 
Rolling Stone uh, uh, made him into a, more or less an enemy. Somebody they were ashamed of. So he didn't have the support that he needed. And uh, William Kunstler uh, had played the role of his lawyer, but Kunstler had been the uh, defender of Lenny Bruce in the famous uh, obscenity trial. Um, but Jim's lawyer was not as good. And I gather uh, it got very messy and very costly and uh, very took a long time. It, it dragged out for uh, the defense, the motions, uh, a period of about a year. There was a supposed abortion that occurred. Never pretend. It would have been interesting if uh, Jim's kid had been born. But he was only 26, 27. Particularly. Don't say this thing. Scream of the Butterfly is one of his more haunting lyrics. And I thought it was apropos of the concept of abortion and the concept of pain that was expressed here. When the music's over is one of his more haunting songs and sums up his American period for me. As the uh, outdoor concert was framed by other montages and different scenes cross-cutting, so was the trial, all around one song when the music's over. That's Bill Kunstler on the left, who was one of the great public advocates of uh, the more uh, outrageous defendants that exist in our system. Business died, couldn't get booked, couldn't get jobs. 68 was a tough year, a crisis year. America was really going through a vast amount of change and fear and shock. People, it was too much for most people. It was, America was on the edge of a nervous breakdown. William Calley, Charles Manson. The end of the uh, hippie era, in a sense, ended with the nightmare and assassination. As if permissiveness were too much. Permissiveness had led to excess, and excess had led to nightmare. I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. We actually shot this at the edge of the Chateau Marmont in, in Los Angeles, the famous hotel. And we put the actors out there in that shot. We had a uh, safety system underneath in case they fell. Needless to say, that is not real whiskey in the shot. They were using sugared water. Very difficult to, to do this in the real hotel, but we, being a stickler for going on location and trying to get realism, I, I went out there and asked the actors to share with me the 13, 14 story look down into the street. They're out there in the wind on the edge of traffic. In his poetry, he mentions Pamela in the same sense as Ophelia. Well, that, as those words say, mad stifled witness. Um, Maybe he saw her as Ophelia, maybe he saw himself as Hamlet. It's an interesting illusion. But there is something about Pamela that was like Ophelia in the sense that she did go mad after he died. And although in the play she died before Hamlet, but she did go mad and had no life beyond Hamlet. There was something stifled about Pam. That scene is not satisfactory to me, never was at the time we're doing it. I just... Uh, Felt like it was late in the movie to, to be going back to poetry. And uh, I felt, uh, still feel that that was more of an obligatory scene that I did uh, for reasons of conventional dramatic narrative. And I uh, would probably move right into this scene instead and pick up Pamela in Paris. It's an interesting concept that you're wanted by the media. That was early on in the 60s, that uh, he had no place to go. He'd been pigeonholed as, the, as a rebel and as a troublemaker. He needed to re-identify himself and wanted to go to Paris to do it with Pamela. At this point, Jim offered American Prayer to his uh, band members, fellow band members. He had it published uh, privately. And he was working on his last album with them. They'd finished the album. It included, I believe, Killer on the Road, but I'm not sure. I think it did. And, uh, was a very productive and creative album, including Roadhouse Blues, which is coming up. This scene is wholly imagined. Uh, I know that he had a decent relationship with the children of, his, of uh, Ray. 
But whether he attended a birthday party or not, I don't know. I like the imagery and the concept of love that line. This is the strangest life I've ever known, which sums up uh, my feelings about Jim Morrison very much. In this scene, he could see himself uh, among the kids and coming back in the 1950s. Uh, uh, close. That's my own son at the age of uh, six or seven. Sitting on the lap of death. Ready to go. Come on, let's get some tacos. Those are his last lines in the movie. Which is actually, I think, what he said at the end of the session. That he recorded the American Prayer Session. Let's go get some tacos. The Paris section is a blur. Here is a ghost talking, whispering to her. It could be him. But the Paris section is clouded with mystery. Who he saw, his last days, whether he was doing heroin or not. Uh, his influences. He was in clubs. He was supposed to be writing, but he was hanging out with a lot of those people that he used to hang out with and partying. Strange. She sees it. I allowed her to see it in a sense because she too is on the road to death. She would die shortly after. She would overdose. She was very unhappy after his death. And he died in a Strange circumstances, obviously many stories, whether he died, where he died, in the bathtub, or whether he died outside, was brought home. He was buried in uh, Père Lachaise in Paris, and his tomb is probably one of the strongest, strangest tourist attractions in the world now. People come from all around the world to pay flowers and wine bottles on his grave, write graffiti. He's buried with artists, and he's honored by the French, and he's honored in the memory of Americans and all people all over the world, and his albums uh, continue to sell. Shoulders smooth as raven's claws. Because he had a tremendous integrity of voice. His words are all from his gut. And though he denies it, the fact is that he was in love with his death. This next song was from that last album. It's called Road Roadhouse Blues. And for a man who's supposedly on the on the outs and de decline, it contains a tremendous enthusiasm, energy, and humor. Killer on the Road is a tremendous song. And I use it at the beginning of the movie. It's one of the few songs I jumped out of sequence, Killer on the Road and put it at the beginning and also it comes in briefly at the end there and represents that as I said, that fertile creative and decadent period the album was recorded the old way like in a garage band in a in a private house and jim sat in the toilet and uh, they went against the studio system that they had been accused of overproducing their songs uh, with too much, uh, you know, too many overlays, and this was a return to the basics. L.A. Woman was the hit single, too, and that was the name of the last album. Mm -hmm. 